Hi, my name is Peter Chin Hong, and I'm an infectious disease physician and faculty member at UCSF. Today I'm going to give an overview of HIV. It is one of the epidemics of our time and one of the strong draws itself to infectious diseases as a career for me, and part of the reason why I journeyed to San Francisco for my own training. Now, more than a quarter of a century into the HIV epidemic, we are still being humbled by this disease. More than 60 million people around the world have been infected, with more than 50% of lives lost. These are our learning objectives for this module. We will first describe the components of the HIV virion that enable us to understand how diagnosis and ultimately treatment of HIV was developed. Finally, we'll give you the tools to understand the natural history of HIV infection. Here is our pathogen map that you all know very well, with HIV as the subject of this module. HIV is the cause of the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. Both HIV-1 and HIV-2 cause AIDS, although HIV-1 is a predominant world HIV type. HIV-2 is pr primarily found in West Africa. HIV mainly infects CD4T helpful lymphocytes, eventually resulting in the loss of cell-mediated immunity and the development of opportunistic infections. HIV is a lentivirus in the group of retroviruses, and this is because it causes slow infection with a long incubation period. It is a retrovirus because the virus uses its own reverse transcriptase enzyme, see the picture, to produce DNA from RNA, which is the reverse of the usual pattern. This DNA is then integrated into the host cell genome. The host cell then treats the viral DNA as part of its own, making all the proteins needed for the virus. Back to the brass tacks. HIV is a single-stranded positive polarity RNA virus. It has a unique look with a bar-shaped core surrounded by an envelope. Look at the image. Why is this feature important? Well, it is important because the envelope contains virus-specific glycoproteins, and these are called GP120 and GP41, which protrude from the surface of the cell and interacts with the CD4 receptor that the virus wants to infect. Differences in GP120 are classified as different HIV clades and have been the subject of various vaccine attempts. GP120 is the one that protrudes from the surface of the viral envelope and GP41 is somewhat embedded in the envelope. We will get to the HIV genome in a second, but the genome contains three structural genes and six regulatory genes. Let's talk about the HIV genome some more. There are three structural genes, GAG, POL, and ENV, typical of retroviruses, and six regulatory genes. The GAG gene encodes the internal core proteins such as P24 protein. Why is P24 important? P24 is important because it is the antigen used in the initial HIV serologic test that we use medically to determine whether someone is HIV infected. Pol encodes reverse transcriptase, which is important for transcribing RNA into DNA. Pol also encodes for integrase, which integrates this viral DNA into host DNA, and protease, which cleaves viral precursor proteins before the virus leaves the cell. You'll understand that integrase and protease are important drug targets for HIV therapy. Finally, among the structural genes, the ENV gene encodes GP120 and GP41, which we spoke about earlier. GP120 and GP41 mediate the attachment of the virus to the host CD4 positive cell. HIV also has six regulatory genes. I'll mention TAT and REV as being important for viral replication. You might hear about the TAT gene because it makes a protein called TAT that represses the production of class 1 MHC proteins and so reduces the ability of T cells to kill HIV infected cells. So far we talked about three important proteins that I wanted to recap here on the slide because they have medical importance as HIV antigens. GP120 and GP41 are encoded by the structural gene ENV. They are the type-specific envelope proteins that we previously talked about because they mediate the attachment of the virus to the CD4 receptor. But they are also interesting in another way as antibodies to GP120 can neutralize the infectivity of HIV. But because there are so many variants of GP120, this has made vaccine attempts uh, very difficult in the past. P24, we have previously mentioned, is encoded by the structural gene called GAG. But unlike GP120, this is not variable. P24 is important because we detect antibodies to P24 using an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or ELISA test with a confirmatory Western blot test. 
Let's talk about the replicative cycle of HIV now. The reason why this is important is because many of the important therapeutic advances against HIV target various steps in the cycle that we'll now outline. The first step, entry, is the binding of GP120 envelope protein from the virus to the CD4 receptor on the cell surface of the CD4 cell. I'll now introduce the concept of the co-receptor. GP120 also needs to interact with the second protein on the surface of the CD4 cell called a chemokine receptor before the virus is allowed in. CCR5 is depicted in the image, but another important chemokine receptor is called CXCR4. Famously, mutations in CCR5 confer protection against HIV infection. The second step, replication, occurs in the cytoplasm. Here, reverse transcriptase transcribes viral RNA into double-stranded DNA. The double-stranded DNA then migrates into the nucleus of the CD4 cell, where it integrates into host DNA. This integration is mediated by an enzyme integrase. The next step is the transcription of viral mRNA by host RNA polymerase. TAT is important here, and then translation into several ginormous viral polyproteins. I'll call this phase processing. These need to be cleaved into svelte viral proteins, and protease will do this handily. It is this cleavage or cutting up of the polyproteins that result in the mature infectious virion. The mature virion then exits the cell. I'm going to show another depiction of the HIV replicative cycle. You may have seen this cartoon previously, and we'll see it again when we discuss HIV therapy. Again, notice that there are three phases of HIV, which are antiviral targets, entry, replication, and processing. For now, don't worry about the names of the drugs. Let's end the section with a discussion of the time course of HIV infection. There are three main stages of HIV HIV infection that I want you to know about. Number one, acute. Number two, clinical latency. And number three, symptoms of AIDS where many of the opportunistic infections and malignancies predominate. The acute stage usually begins two to four weeks after the infection. Patient may complain of a mono-like illness with fever, sore throat, malaise, generalized lymphadenopathy. They may also have a, a general maculopapular rash at this point, which could be an important clue or tip-off to acute infection in the astute clinician in the emergency department, for example. There's a high HIV viral load at this point. Look at the red line on the graph and a corresponding dip in the CD4 cells. Look at the blue line. The patient is extremely infectious at this point. This eventually results with no intervention, with a decrease in HIV viral load and an increase in CD4 T cells. Most patients are convert by three to four weeks after infection. The inability to detect antibodies prior to this time can result in false negative antibody testing. This is also called the window period. This is an important public health issue as patients can be highly infectious at this point with a false negative antibody test. Clinicians who suspect HIV at this point would typically perform an HIV viral load or PCR. In the clinical latency phase, there's a long latency period, typically 7 to 11 years in untreated infection, where patients may be asymptomatic during this period. At this time, a large amount of HIV is being produced and hidden in lymph nodes. In the late stage of infection, called AIDS, CD4 cells decline to a point where serious opportunistic infections and malignancies can emerge. Untreated at this stage, mortality is 100%. AIDS is a devastating illness in this way. In other parts of this module, we will discuss in more detail how CD4 count and HIV viral load can guide treatment and prophylactic decisions, and what specific opportunistic infections and malignancies can occur at various phases of the disease. Thank you for your attention.